This here is a digital clock and it shows the time by using binary numbers. Right now, for example, it shows 3.14 p.m. It takes some practice to read it fast enough, especially with the seconds blinking on and off more quickly, but I think it's a very unique look that can also be a lot of fun. And when the power goes out like this, the clock uses a built-in battery so that when the power comes back on again later, the time is still correct. Now, if the LEDs are too bright or too dim, you can adjust that with this knob here on the side. Just keep turning it until you find the brightness you like. And when you press it, you can adjust the time. The hours are first, just turn the knob to adjust them and when you are done, press it again and adjust the minutes. And then when you press it again, you can cycle through all available colors and confirm your choice with a third press of the button. And this is how it looks like when we build it not on a breadboard but on a perfboard instead and put it inside a proper housing. This is a vintage floppy disk holder and I think the LEDs look absolutely spectacular behind this dark and ripped acrylic. The backup battery is mounted below and the adjustment knob is on the back next to a USB-C port to connect power with a common phone charger. I actually ended up liking this clock so much that I built four of them and of course they are not synced up in this video here but you have to admit showing the time in binary code is really something else. Hi, my name is Jens and I believe that everybody can learn electronics and today we will build a special type of clock called a binary clock. Now the first row is the hours, the second row is the minutes and the third row is the seconds and right now here it's 10.53 p.m. Now it takes some time to get used to this kind of clock and to read it more fluently but I think it's a lot of fun. What's also really nice about this clock is that it uses WS2812 NeoPixel LEDs and those are just really easy to work with, not a lot of crazy wires going on. So Overall, just a very pleasant experience and you can even adjust the color to anything you like. All right, enough talking, let's go ahead and build this thing. As always, I like to start with a list of components that we need. First is a breadboard as well as a 4.5 volt battery pack like this one here. We need a rotary encoder to set the time and the DS3002 real time clock IC to remember the time together with a 32.768 kHz watch crystal as well as a coin cell battery pack for backup power. And you can find ready-made modules like these here with all these components on them. I have a link for you in the description. To show the time, we will use 18 WS2812 NeoPixel RGB LEDs. And this piece here is just cut out of an ordinary 5 volt LED strip. Other than that, we need the PIC16F1455 microcontroller as the brains of the operation. And to stabilize everything, we need a single 470 ohms resistor, two 100 nanofarad capacitors, and four chunky 100 microfarad capacitors. And to program our microcontroller, we need the PICKIT3 with the usual 5 terminal connecting cable. All of these components, plus links where you can buy them, are listed in detail on the right hand side of the companion article that you can find on friendlywire.com. The link is in the description. Here is the schematic for our new and improved binary clock. This here is the PIC16F1455 microcontroller. Three of its inputs are connected to the rotary encoder. Two of them detect the direction in which it is turned and another one is connected to the internal push button. These capacitors here next to the PIC are there for stability. And this is our real-time clock IC, the DS1302, which has three wires shared with the PIC, clock, data and enable. The watch crystal is directly connected to the DS1302 so that it can generate a stable 1Hz clock signal independent of the PIC controller. And for that reason, it also has its own 3 volt backup battery directly connected to it as well. And for stability, it also gets its own 100 nanofarad bypass capacitor. This huge chunk up here are our 18 LEDs. Now most of this is pretty straightforward because it's just individual LEDs all wired in series and if you use an LED strip you won't actually have to do all that wiring yourself. But there are a few details that I wanted to mention. First off, this 470 ohms resistor is there to protect our PIC. The PIC sends out the LED data from pin RC2 down here. Usually the input pins of the WS2812 NeoPixel LEDs are high impedance, but when all LEDs are turned on, the circuit draws a lot of power, which can make the supply voltage go down in some places of the circuit. If that happens, a small current can flow into the pick, and this resistor basically limits that current to a non-lethal amount. If you have a good power supply, you don't necessarily need this, but hey, it's a cheap component that may save a more expensive one, so why not? 
The last detail I wanted to mention are these capacitors here, C4, C5 and C6. They are kind of big with 100 microfarad each and I drew them close to each of the three LED strip segments. We only use 18 LEDs, but keep in mind that each of these LEDs actually has three internal LEDs because these are RGB LEDs, so it's actually 54 LEDs in total. And they can draw up to 20 milliamps each at full brightness. So we are talking about a maximum current of one amp, which is definitely noticeable and can put a lot of strain on your power supply. And especially on a breadboard, it is really important to ease that strain as much as possible and these capacitors do exactly that. We will talk a bit more about this later when we build the circuit on a breadboard. And actually, why don't we just get started with it? Place the breadboard in front of you and because spacing will be a bit tight, I recommend to have line one to the left so you can use the same wiring that I did. First place the pick in row 12 with its notch facing to the left and then insert the DS1302 in row 21 with its notch facing to the right. We will place the rotary encoder in row 5 like this, but as you can see it's a bit big and it's hard to see where the wires will go from that perspective, so let's remove it again and just remember that its connections are here. We will plug it back in again later. Next let's insert the DS1302's backup battery with its positive terminal in row 24 so that its negative terminal ends up in row 32. And then let's connect it up to the ground rail like this. While we're thinking about power, let's connect the power rails on both sides of the breadboard like this in rows 1 and 2. And then we can also connect power to the pick. Pin 1 is VDD and pin 14 is ground. And it's also a good idea to add the 100 nanofarad bypass capacitor C2 close to the chip like this and the chunky 100 microfarad bulk capacitor C1 straight into the power rail. For the DS1302, VDD goes to pin 1 and ground goes to pin 4 and we can already add the crystal between pins 2 and 3 as well as the 100 nanofarad bypass capacitor C3 between pins 1 and 4. Then it's time to connect our for now imaginary rotary encoder. Pin A goes from row 5 to pin 3 of the pick, pin B from row 7 to pin 2 and on the other side the push button terminal goes from row 7 to pin 4 like this. Pin C is ground and goes into the ground rail and so does the other side of the push button. You know what, I thought this would make things easier somehow, but I think in the end it was just more complicated without the rotary encoder visible here. Anyway, next to connect the DS1302 to the pick, we need to connect pin 5 to 5, pin 6 to 6 and pin 7 to 7. And keep in mind that these two chips are back to back when you make those connections. Now what about the LEDs? We can just cut three pieces out of an LED strip with six LEDs each and here you can see the pinout. When data is going from left to right, ground is up here, data is always in the middle and plus 5 volts is at the bottom. Then I soldered some wires to the three pieces so that they fit directly onto our breadboard for maximum neatness. And to get ready for our LEDs, place the 470 ohms resistor at pin 8 of the pick. Then plug in the first LED strip module like this. I cut the green data wire to the correct length so that it plugs in directly into the data signal after the resistor. The other modules plug in like this and like this. And again I made sure that the green data wires line up so that the data is really passed along the three LED strip segments. So the data goes in here, comes out here and then goes through the middle strip like this and enters the last one like this. So we have to make sure that the middle strip is actually flipped around horizontally. Now we need to make sure that the LED strips get power. First connect VDD in row 58 to the upper positive power rail and then ground in row 58 to the lower part of the negative power rail. And for better conductivity I decided to also add an extra VDD and ground line for the middle module. And finally for stability each LED strip gets its own 100 microfarad capacitor. It may seem overkill but I found it necessary when working on a breadboard and we'll get back to that later. Now we can plug in the rotary encoder in row 5 and remember to bend the pins like this. I really find this fits into a breadboard more easily. Also you may want to add some hot glue or some other type of adhesive on the backside because these things tend to jump out of breadboards. And last we have to connect the PIC Kit 3 to the PIC 16 F1455 so that we can program it from our computer and this is how it looks like. VTD and VSS go straight into the power rail, program data goes to pin 10 of the PIC, program clock to pin 9 and master clear to pin 4. And on the other side, plug the USB end of the Picket 3 into your computer. Oh and don't forget to connect our power supply as well. Make sure that the power cables have a good connection to the power rail, this is very important. 
So we're done with building the clock, but of course nothing happens yet when we turn it on because we need to write a program first. And for that, we need three different things. We need the MPLAB IDE to write the code. We need the XC8 compiler to turn the code into something that the microcontroller can understand, and that's usually called a hex file. And then we need the MPLAB IPE to take that hex file and put it onto the controller. And for that last part, we also need the PickKit 3. Now I know that this all sounds a little bit scary and overwhelming and if you feel that way, don't worry, I have a very detailed introduction video for you right here that walks you through all the basic steps. First, start the MPLAB IDE and create a new standalone project for the PIC16F1455 microcontroller. Select the XC8 compiler and after finishing up the setup, let's add an empty main.c file to our project and that is where our program will go. Speaking of which, go to the Binary Clock Companion article on FriendlyWire.com and copy the source code at the bottom of the page. Back inside the MPLAB IDE, delete everything in the main.c file and then paste the source code from the website. After that, up in the toolbar, click on the compile symbol. And after a few seconds and a successful build, the compiler tells us where we can find the hex file we just created. It is in the dist default production folder of our project. Now start the MBLAB IPE. Select the PIC16F1455 as our device and the PICKIT3 as our tool in the settings and then click on connect. After a few seconds, the PIC16F1455 should be detected. In the hex file line, click on browse and open the hex file we just created. Click on the program symbol and after a few seconds, we are done. You can now remove the wires from the PICKIT3 and your binary clock is ready to go. Now this video here, like all my other videos, is supposed to be a tutorial, which means I want to show you exactly how and why everything works. There's just one small problem. The code for this binary clock ended up being around 750 lines, which is a bit on the long side to cover in detail in this video here. But believe it or not, if you have a look at it, you actually may recognize parts of this code from previous videos. Like this part here deals with the rotary encoder. This part here deals with the DS1302 real-time clock IC, and this part here deals with the NeoPixel LEDs that we all covered in previous videos. But if you want to have more details on the code, I invite you to check out the companion article right here. Now chances are if you build this project on a breadboard, you will run into some sort of problems. And I want to save you some time, so let's talk a little bit about some common pitfalls when building this type of thing on a breadboard. If you think about it, the maximum current in our circuit is actually quite high. We have 54 LEDs in total, which at full brightness each take 20 milliamps. That's around one amp in total. Okay, maybe it doesn't sound like much, but what does it mean on our breadboard? Well, first let's think about voltage drops. At one amp, a resistance of only one ohm is enough to cause a one volt drop in voltage, which is huge when working with only 4.5 volts. And a one ohm resistance is nothing on a breadboard. You can easily get resistances of dozens of ohms if you don't plug in the cables correctly. You could have 4.5 volt here, right where the battery cable comes in, but only three volts down here. Not good. So we have to make sure that all connections from the power rail to the LED strips are as conductive as possible and sometimes it helps to insert additional wires to cut down the overall resistance. This is a bit of a trial and error type of thing, but you have to figure it out when working on a breadboard. And second, there can be power surges whenever a lot of LEDs turn on or when we increase the brightness rapidly. And for that, I added the 100 microfarad capacitors, one for each LED strip segment. It really helps to stabilize things because they act as little power reservoirs. And because they are close to their LEDs, the resistance in the breadboard connections also doesn't play that much of a role. If you want, remove the capacitors and just see what happens. So while you can totally make it work, breadboards are not always ideal. For that reason, I thought I would build a few more of those binary clocks, but this time around, I wanted to use perf boards and solder everything. While that removes the resistance problem that you have with poor contacts on breadboards, it does take a fair amount longer. As you saw at the beginning of this video, I then installed these boards in old school floppy disk foldout cases that I found at a thrift store. The perf board size worked out perfectly with the size of the foldout piece and I used brass standoffs to mount the boards in place. And I really love how everything came together at this point. The knob, the backup battery and the power input plug into these connectors here so that we can remove the board if we ever need to. The knob and the USB type C port are on the back of the case and the battery is mounted separately under the case so that it can be replaced easily. Now I thought about spray painting the housing itself, but then I stopped and realized that I already quite liked how they looked, so I kept them as is. 
I hope I could inspire you to give it a go and try to build this clock yourself. I promise it will be fun. If it's a bit too much, you know, maybe you're just getting started, then go check out the tutorials on the rotary encoder, on the LEDs, and you will see that you too can learn microcontrollers in no time at all. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know what else you want to learn, and I'll see you next time.